series called Small Story, Big Story, uh, taking a fresh look at some of the seminal stories in our scripture library to find out uh, how these small stories might point us to the big story of God's love for all of us and for us, maybe even finding the heart of our story in the midst of that big story as well. Uh, but before we go to the big scripture story for today, I want to tell you the story of one of my favorite family pictures. Um, it's this one right here which I know is a little hard to tell exactly what you're looking at, uh, but this is why it's one of my favorites, because this is a picture of my grandfather's foot at the top of the Eiffel Tower. Um, in World War II, he, was, he served installing radar and weather and radio across Europe, uh, weather stations that would uh, become important on D-Day to help the Allied forces have the Elmer Prize on Nazi Germany. And on this day, he was installing a radio transmitter at the top of the Eiffel Tower by climbing up to the top. That rope there is, um, that you see tied around the metal there was an OSHA-compliant rope that he used for safety, I'm sure. <laughs> but I think about this picture and think about the fact that he was uh, 21 years old. And there beneath his feet, in some ways, the world hung in the balance. Hopefully he hung balance there in that moment too. And I think about the wonder of what that must have been to be at the center of history with your feet kind of hanging off the edge into the future. Because he was right in the middle of it all. He had been issued an apartment on the Champs-Élysées, the grand road between the Eiffel Tower and the Arc de Triomphe. Then on VE Day, on the victory celebration on May 8, 1945, a million people flooded out into the street outside his apartment, and he was there in the midst of it as they celebrated, as they made merry. Um, the bands played all of the national anthems, and the world, they were celebrating. The world had been transformed in a real way, that a great evil had, become, had been overcome, and there was a proper party. My grandfather told me, as I asked him about it, he said it, it was awesome which may be paraphrasing my grandfather, but that's basically what he said. But he also said that it was way too crowded. And so he stayed out there for about a month, about an hour, and then he headed back to his apartment. And then eventually he headed back home like everyone did because the victory was won, the war in Europe was over. Uh, but the work to do wasn't over. In Europe, there was restoration and re reparation, and repair and reconciliation. And my grandfather returned to America, a country that had just triumphed and given of itself in a battle against a great prejudiced evil. But he returned back home to an America that was segregated, that was living under the terror of Jim Crow, to an America where Japanese citizens were in internment camps, some of the same camps which are being recommissioned now as detention camps for migrant children and families. The war was over in some ways, but the work was still with us. Finding a way to live out and up to the ideals and the values that he lifted to the top of the Eiffel Tower, that work was with him, and that work is still with us. And so sometimes I feel a little bit like that picture. Like you look out at this world and it seems like we've got a long way to go until we reach solid ground together. And our toes are hanging over the edge. We're wondering, what's the next step for us to take? There's so much work to be done in our world, in our country, at our borders, in our community, in our families, in our lives. What do we do next on this great climb? For my grandfather, when he returned, he knew exactly what he was doing next. He had to finish one more year in high school after he came back from this experience. And so that's what he did next. But for those of us who... We wonder where that next step is. Um, and even as we're hanging on to whatever OSHA-rated support we can hold on to along the way, there's this whisper to us, this call to be a part of creating the next steps, to edge our feet over the uncertain future and maybe even help create it. This whisper to help be a part of healing our communities and our world and our lives, to be people who take a little risk to climb a little higher and help love with a little more radical, restorative, generous love to seek in our world justice and peace and equality and flourishing for all people, to be a part of that work that is ours to do. And so maybe we hear that whisper for the very first time in a question that we ask ourselves, you know, as our heart is moved, we ask, what can we do? I feel so 
ill-equipped for this job. But the witness of so many people is that not that God calls those who are already equipped, but that God equips those that are called, and we are all called to be a part of this work, of bringing shalom, of bringing flourishing for all people in our world. And so there's this whisper of the divine in us that says, just put your toes over the edge a little bit, the edge of that future, and I'll equip you as you go. Listen to me, and listen to your neighbor, and listen to yourself, and we'll teach you what you need to know. And it's true, and the story that we're talking about today exemplifies that kind of work. And so there's a lot for us to learn in the story that we're talking about today, but truthfully, it's not something that when I was younger, I really got out of this story, because today we're talking about the story of a guy named Zacchaeus. Maybe you've heard of Zacchaeus before. It's a story um, that I finally learned how to spell correctly this week after typing it a thousand times into my notes. It's two C's and like an A before the E, just in case you're wondering. But Word still puts the squiggly red thing underneath it. Um, so I finally learned how to, how, to, how to spell it, but I also, I think, heard this story in a new way today. It's a story, yes, about climbing and putting your feet over the edge, and, and also about climbing down and getting to work. And usually this is a story that we tell to kids, if you've ever heard it before. You maybe have heard it when you were a kid. And I think the reason that we tell it to kids is because it is the story, as you'll see, that involves tree climbing and being short, which are two things that kids can usually relate to, and like this adult can relate to as well. And so this story really resonated with me as well. We also tell it to kids because it, is a, is a song, it has a catchy song that goes along with it. It's no baby shark, but, uh, but it's a song that goes, Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he, right? He climbed up in a sycamore tree, the Lord he wanted to see, yes. And so basically what we learned from Zacchaeus was a song and what the word we means, um, which for me was surprisingly important in my life, that word we. But we, essentially, that's what we got from Zacchaeus. But when we hear it fresh, I think there's a vibrant, powerful, in some ways subversive story at the heart of it, an invitation to us all, we and not so we, in our lives, to be a part of the creative, even risky next steps to bring goodness and healing and reconciliation to a world that so needs it, and helping create an abundant future for all people in this future that God just might be whispering and calling us to. So we find the story of Zacchaeus in Luke chapter 19, um, in the story of Jesus' life. And this is, this is toward the end of this. And Jesus is leading a vagabond ba band of friends toward Jerusalem and passes through Jericho. And at this point in kind of the life of Jesus, the crowd that was gathering along Jesus' journey made this journey a little bit more like a parade, really. People would show up and just watch him walk by, which is really like every journey should aim to be a parade by the end of it. That's kind of my squad goals along the way. So here in Jericho, the story says there was this man named Zacchaeus who was a chief tax collector, uh, and he was rich, very rich, and he was not very popular. And so if you'd heard this story in this day, if you heard this description of this guy named Zacchaeus, and I said tax collector, you would have all booed loudly and like thrown a sandal or something. Um, and you would have been justified for this, because at the time of Jesus, uh, Palestine, where he lived, was occupied by the Roman Empire. And to assess taxes, they hired local Jewish folks who knew their community and the people within it to make sure that everyone in the community was paid up. And the deal worked like this. If you were a tax collector, whatever you could collect above the tax rate, you got to keep as profit. And so it was an industry that was rife with corruption and exploitation and oppression and lots and lots of income, be it gotten by exploitation. So tax collectors were considered collaborators with the Roman Empire, traitors to their people and the epitome in some ways of corruption. And Zacchaeus was their chief, the story says. He was in charge. And so, yeah, you would boo and you would throw a sandal if you had one this day. We don't know much beyond that of the backstory of Zacchaeus, but we do know that there was something somehow in this person of Jesus that intrigued him. And it doesn't make a lot of sense that Zacchaeus would be intrigued because Jesus had some very difficult words for those who exploit, do harm, do injustice to their neighbor, 
had difficult words for the rich in Jesus' day. But Zacchaeus also knew that in Jesus' circle of friends was a former tax collector that Jesus loved and was kind to when everyone else was throwing sandals. And so on this day, Zacchaeus was drawing near, trying to see who Jesus was, it says. Maybe Zacchaeus was was trying to see what this person was all about, or maybe hoping for a way out of his situation, or some sense of worth in himself that his riches never got him, or maybe he was just curious about it all. Maybe he just liked climbing trees, and because that's what he does next. The crowd is passing by, Jesus is passing by, and Zacchaeus cannot see because he is, like after all, a wee little man. And so he climbs up the sycamore tree to get a better look, which to the ancient audience would have been hilarious, that this wealthy high-class Zacchaeus climb the tree to glimpse a parade of vagabonds, but that's what the story and all of its irony tells us. And so Jesus spots him and calls out to him, Zacchaeus, and immediately like a thousand heads just turn and look at the guy in the tree, you know, all eyes on Z in this moment. And Jesus says something stunning to him, Zacchaeus, hurry, come down, I must go to your house today. And so Jesus invites himself over to Zacchaeus' house. If you were here last week, we caught Jesus not saying please, if you remember that. And this week, Jesus is just like inviting himself over to people's houses. And so once again, as a parent, I want to tell my kids, don't be like Jesus. Say please and don't invite yourself over to people's houses. Right? But here's the story. And so the crowd was pretty upset, not at Jesus for inviting himself over to Zacchaeus' house, but for Jesus going to Zacchaeus' house. Because house hospitality was kind of a a form of of kinship, of deep connection. And in the culture of the day, you don't dine with the unrighteous. And so dining meant in some ways you were joining in a deep way with this person who was hosting. And Jesus was joining with Zacchaeus, the chief of tax collectors. But Jesus saw Zacchaeus, saw him in the tree and saw something that caught his eye. I think he saw him for who he was. He didn't compromise his message of justice to go to his house, but he also saw him with eyes of hope for what could be, for a future that required a risky step. And he loved him, and he wanted to help him and give him a chance. And who knows the last time that anyone had been over to Zacchaeus' house for a meal. But God's love extends to all people, us in this room, in the tax collector, included and maybe in this moment Zacchaeus realized that for the first time he'd gotten so used to being hated that he forgot that he was worthy of love and when he realized that it began to change things there are all kinds of things that lead our hearts to opening but in essence it comes when we choose love over fear and humanity over otherness and it's that simple choice that begins to birth in us creativity transformation openness and new possibilities. When everyone had written off Zacchaeus, Jesus chose love, and it opened up the possibility, the door to transformation. Jesus was not condoning Zacchaeus' injustice. This was Jesus believing that justice was possible and going right to the source. And so Zacchaeus climbed down, and Jesus set about the work to be done over a meal at Zacchaeus' place. And in my childhood memory, this is kind of where the story ends. You know, Zacchaeus climbs a tree, Jesus sees him, invites himself over to his house, and like they go have, have brunch together. And that's kind of how the story goes. Um, but actually, that's not where the story ends at all. That's really where the work of the story begins. It's just the beginning of the story. Like my granddad returning to America from the Eiffel Tower, like us waking up to God's love for us, like Zacchaeus climbing down the tree, in some way the story is just beginning in those moments, that there's more to be written. There's work to be done. And for Zacchaeus and Jesus, like all the best work, it happened over brunch. So there they are with their avocado toast, I'm sure. Jesus is sitting with Zacchaeus, this Zacchaeus guy who's a part of these systems of impression and injustice, and a person who is becoming open to something new. It's this both and moment. And we don't know exactly what they talked about, but something happened in that conversation, as we'll see. And so we can imagine maybe how the conversation went. I'm sure Jesus started by listening because he always seems to start that way. And as they talked, I'm sure Jesus began to unpack these fundamental truths that we see elsewhere. God's solidarity with and compassion for the vulnerable and the marginal. 
Zacchaeus' participation in, in the systems that perpetuate that harm. The truth that, that God is the defender of the weak, the protector of the vulnerable, and the sojourner who executes justice for the marginalized and simply ask that we pursue justice, that we love kindness and mercy, and that we walk humbly with God and with each other about how loving our God and our neighbor, just as we are, that that love is one and the same. And Jesus told him that he is loved and that he is invited to help create the future. And it begins with love of neighbor. And so Zacchaeus listened. And even if he didn't get it at all in that moment, he listened. And he edged his feet toward the edge of a different future. That Zacchaeus listened to Jesus was something. Because he didn't have to listen. Jesus wasn't Rome. Jesus wasn't Caesar. Jesus was no person of power in Zacchaeus's world. And so I always imagine this scene as they sit over this meal together as kind of the meeting of equals in some ways. But it wasn't that at all. Jesus was a poor vagabond teacher, part of the very vulnerable class that was caught under the wheels of power that Zacchaeus was complicit in. Jesus was an Afro-Semitic refugee son of a laborer from a rough, tumble, backwater city in a rough, tumble, backwater part of the world. He was a marginalized minority speaking to Zacchaeus. And Zacchaeus listened, listened to his voice. And when he listened, I think he heard the whisper Maybe the voice of God in that. As I was reading through this story this week, this realization of this conversation and what happened there is where the story stopped being about Zacchaeus and started being a little bit about me. Because I couldn't help but think of, of all the voices speaking to me right now, asking me to listen. Voices of the marginalized, voices of my neighbors, of fellow children of God, of sacred work of Muslim friends and migrant kids and working moms and on and on, and they're speaking. And I wonder, am I listening? Can I hear in their voices that whisper of God, just like Zacchaeus listened? And when I listen, can I take my feet to the edge to put them over the edge of an uncertain future and take action and take the next step of creating it, maybe even without the aid for once of my OSHA safety rope? and let go, and take a step. And that's exactly what Zacchaeus did. In responses to Jesus' presence there of grace and truth with him, Zacchaeus took action. And so he stands up and he declares this. He says, look, half of my possessions, Lord, I will give to the poor, which is incredible. Uh, And it's never happened at any brunch that I've ever been to, but it happened on this day because Zacchaeus was listening and changing. And immediately he sees that this requires a response. And the right response is to use what he has for the good of the kingdom. To take his power and power down. To lend and to leverage his wealth and his power and his privilege and his opportunity for the sake of those who could benefit the most from it. Now, we may not be able to give away like half of what we have to the poor um, monetarily, or else we might be giving away all of our apartment lease if we tried to do that. But we can give away what we have our every opportunity and privilege, our next steps to use them for the sake of others who need them and the good of the whole community. It begins by listening to the story of a neighbor, reaching out to a friend in need, trying to understand the experience of someone who's different than you and giving it the same credibility and validity that you extend to your own story and to stand with them and to stand up for them in the spaces that you move and to give of yourself, to power down and to use that power for others. And so for me, here's what I'm working on. To not just speak all the time, but to listen first and fundamentally. And to show up in solidarity and support of other people who are speaking. To use the mics that I have for good and to pass the mic as often as I can. To lend what I have for the good of others and particularly those marginalized and vulnerable. And I began to see as I think through those things that this is what love of neighbor could look like in action. But Zacchaeus didn't just stop there. After, after powering down, he did something even more unbelievable. He climbed down and went about the work of trying to make things right. And he says this, And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will pay back four times as much. 
And everybody just goes, wow. Because in Jewish law, there was the concept of reparation, of making amends for a wrong that one has done by paying money or otherwise helping those who have been wrong. And it comes from the English word to repair. Not that it makes wrongs right, but that it starts the process of repair. And in Jewish law, it typically meant paying back what was owed plus 20%. But Zacchaeus was doing something totally different. So far above and beyond. Four times what was owed, he paid back. Because Zacchaeus realizes that this wasn't about law or legality, that this was about love. That being right by each other was a spiritual matter. And that something fundamental has been torn in this interwoven human fabric that cannot be measured or appreciated. And we should do all and give all and live all that we can to begin the process of repair. That this isn't about laws or legality, this is about love and life and liberation. And that is worth everything. From Zacchaeus, for, from Jesus, Zacchaeus experienced that same kind of surprising, abundant, restorative, repairing, generous love. That love that called to him on the tree and empowered him and compelled him to be surprisingly generous in response. And that same generosity began to repair his own life, and he let it flow out of him like living water. I heard someone describe the process of interpersonal relationship and restoration to be like a treasure chest in a locked room. And they said the first step is to unlock the door to the room with remorse and forgiveness. But reparation, making amends and repair, trying our best in generous love, that's what opens the chest. And the treasure inside, when we do the work to repair, is reconciliation. A new kind of relationship, a new possibility, new life marked by peace and possibility, reconciliation. And as the followers of Jesus began to write out their summary of what that call is that is whispered in our lives, those were the languages and the words that they used. They said all of this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation, that we've been love and our call is to go into the world and do the work to begin to repair what has been broken and torn in our lives and our walk and in our communities and cultures and societies and countries and world we have been called to be ministers of reconciliation to be Zacchaeus to climb down and do the work and to do more than is expected to live out generous justice to be ministers of reconciliation and so I started thinking of all the places in my life that that call is whispered over me. Of those places that I feel whispered to do more, just like Zacchaeus, for the poor and for the working poor. For race relations and standing with black, black lives and brown lives in the aftermath of Jim Crow that still exists in our world, to stand up for the systems of supremacy. To seek out and work for LGBTQ rights and affirmation, for gender equality and opportunity to stand with the migrant and the sojourner among us, what would it look like for me to give back four times what is expected? To let my love in some small way reflect the love of God, which is a million times more than we expect. What would it look like to give back like Zacchaeus? In my own personal life, in the relationships that I've harmed, of those times when I've hurt those that I've loved, what would it look like to give back four times what would it look like to be four times as present with my kids and give back four times what Facebook has taken from me in those moments? What would it look like for the church, the capital C church, that has sometimes been party to harm and hurt and hate throughout its history? What would it look like for this community to be a part of giving back four times the life and the love and the liberation and the listening? And as I thought through that, it was a little unsettling to go through the debts there was pain and there was repentance. But even more, there was an explosion of possibility. A bubbling spring of creativity and life and new possibility. I could see glimpses of that treasure chest of reconciliation, which is beautiful. But Jesus described it in an even more profound way. When Zacchaeus declares this, that he's giving back generously, working to repair and restore and seek reconciliation, Jesus says this about what's happening. He says, Jesus says to him, today salvation has come to this house. 
salvation, not just for Zacchaeus, but for the house, for the community. And salvation here isn't about like the, just the going to heaven someday part that we usually frame that word by. So teria means rescue, deliverance, liberation. And Zacchaeus was a part of bringing liberation and life to his community, life and life in all its abundance. Just a glimpse of the liberation that God is working together for us all, that treasure of reconciliation in our world, the future that we are invited to help create. And so Zacchaeus, this wee little man, climbed down from his tree, the story says, and went to work with the real work to be done. And in that little tale, there is a story hidden, a story of transformation, of reconciliation, of reparation, and even salvation and liberation. And so when you get a chance to sing that song, either in VBS or when it comes on the radio when you're listening to um, KXT, sing that song with glee, but most of all, live that lesson with joy. The Zacchaeus who glimpsed the generous grace of a Jesus who called him from the tree and invited him into this generous justice of a world being made right. And he glimpsed the truth that is there for us all, that we are so loved. And because of that, we can so love our world a million times more than is expected. And when we do that, I think we'll see salvation, just as Jesus promised, life and life abundant. And so what if we, this week and in the weeks to come, decided that we were going to put our toes over the edge, that the world hangs in the balance, that we would lean over an uncertain future with courage, with love, liberation, with life? What if we did more than was expected? Four times, five times. To be a part of the future that God is inviting us to help create in our work, in God's empowering, in our generation, in our house, we just might see a glimpse of salvation. Let's pray together. Gracious, loving God, more than we expect, loving God. His beauty in creation and the lives of those around us and the diversity of this world surprises us. God, but most of all, that your grace, your continual care for us surprises us too. God, some of us are up on the tree, curious, just looking, but feeling called and compelled to step into this world and be ministers of reconciliation. God, thank you for calling us when we were up high. For others of us, God, we are like Jesus, part of the vulnerable community, feel caught in this world. God, thank you for your solidarity with us and for those places that we see that you are at work in our world and give us the chance to be a part of that too. God, but for all of us loved and invited and called, Help us to do more this week, that we might be people of your love that is so much more. As we hang our feet over, take a risk, take a step, and lean into the future and help create it in love and life and liberation. God, thank you for your work among us. Thank you for your invitation to be a part of it. And thank you for this beautiful world that we get to do it. We pray this in your name. So sometimes it's kind of a...